Thank you, brother. I hadn't said much about being here uh, in the last few days, but I am glad and have been glad to be here this weekend. The Lord's been good to me. I've really enjoyed it. I've uh, got blessed, heard a lot of good stuff, and appreciate all the sermons, the messages that we've heard from me or other two brothers. And uh, might want to mention a thing or two. Uh, I want you to pray for us. The Lord will help us. Um, We'll be praying for you. I appreciate this school being here beside this church. Uh, it's a good place. I'm glad that we've got a place when young men come up to me and they say, the Lord's called me to preach. And they say, I want to learn the Bible. Where should I go? I'm glad I've got somewhere to tell them to go. And I appreciate you for being here. appreciate uh, the board, the workers, those that labor week after week after week and pay the bills and keep the school going and all of that. Uh, you won't know until the Lord comes uh, what all it's accomplished. It's getting a lot more done than you may realize. And the Lord's Word won't return void. Uh, there ain't much to that other stuff. I saw, heard about this church bulletin. And in their church bulletin, they told what the pastor was going to preach on. And then they'll have a you know the hymn for the day or something like that. And it said the pastor would be preaching this Sunday on... The Apocrypha, Between the Testaments, was the title of the sermon. The title of the hymn for the day was, Nothing Between. And all that other stuff's going to wind up nowhere one of these days, but the Word of God will stand, as we say out in the mountains, it'll stand when the world's on fire. And I believe it will. Um, I read an article in the Charlotte Observer back before Christmas, and they were... They had a guy on there, and he was talking about religious items were selling good this year. And it was the Inspiration Bookstore, and he said, the best seller that they had this year was a ceramic Santa Claus kneeling beside the baby Jesus and uh, getting his life straightened out. It's about time. Been lying all these years. And then he said that the best seller was the NIV. And the, and the owner of the store quoted this. He said, people buy fancy gift Bibles that are King James that are never intended to be read. But when people ask for the NIV, you know they're serious. Now, he made several, several claims in that little statement. First of all, he said that anybody that bought a King James Bible was not intending to read it. Now, he speak for himself, amen? Amen. And then he said that if you you boss asked for the NIV, you're serious. I guess that means if you ask for a King James, you're not serious. And I'll tell you why the NIV is outselling the King James in that bookstore. Because as soon as you walk in the door, there's a picture this big hits you right in the face. And there, here's one and here's one and here's one. You have to hunt down three clerks to find the King James Version. And the other ones are, are just sitting out, try this, try this, the best one out. they got the prettiest backs on them now. They're making them thumb index. They're doing, and they've got a few little hardback King James gift Bibles over there somewhere. Uh, and you know who's in control of all that stuff. It ain't the Lord. And so that gives you a little bit of idea about uh, what's going on. Uh, some of you take think North Carolina's heaven. It's, about, uh, it's a lot closer than this is, but it's, there's a lot of hell going on up there. Amen. In the paper they say they had this thing made out of snow and it was just a big fat round ball down here and another big fat round ball of snow, not as fat as that first big ball on top of it. And then a little ball of snow on top of that looked like it had eyes. And you know, you know what that is, I guess, don't you? You know what the paper said? It says, in this community, this snow person was seen. Have you ever heard such ramblings and ravings in all of your life? A snow person. It's supposed to snow tonight, and tomorrow when I get home, I'm going to take my girls out in the yard and build a snow person. Some, some stupid man probably thought that up because he's afraid of some stupider woman. 
Uh, I don't know how stuff like that gets going. They said the spokesperson for this committee will be so and so. What a word, a spokesperson. I don't know if they're... Uh, they're like those... They're like Schofield's imaginary angels. They're sexless. They're not a man. They're not a woman. I don't know what they are. They're like some of these creatures we've seen last night. And I know what the brother's talking about, about being scared when he went home. I went back to the motel. You ain't going to believe this. I got in there and the weirdest feeling come in that room. And I done the same thing he done. I turned the tape player on, played some gospel music, and everything's all right. But I tell you what we saw last night is nothing to be fooling with. It's not a joke. And I wouldn't advise any of you. There's been several that have come up and said, you'd like to do something like that. I wouldn't advise it. I don't like to fool with it too often. And if you ain't careful, you can wind up like Bob Harrington fooling around them strip joints so long that it gets on you. And so uh, I hope that you'll just pray and keep yourself clean. Let the Lord lead you. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to read a pretty verse of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 12. When the Lord saved you, He entered you into a race. Are you saved? If you are, then the Lord... I believe you. you the Lord put you in a race. And your job is to do what the Bible said here, to run the race, brother. Now, I don't know how long you've been saved, but you ain't getting no younger. No, you're not. You're not getting no younger. Uh, some of you ladies, the older you get, the more you have to do like Tammy Faye. You have to. You, I could write my initials inside of your face or my finger. And you do that because you know you're swiveling up, man. You're withering away. And about the time you, about the time you realize you're growing up, you start getting ready to die, you know what? Uh, by the time your face gets clear, your mind gets fuzzy. And all five billion of us on this planet are getting older. You might as well face it. You ain't what you used to be. I mean, you just might as well face it. And, and all these people nowadays are trying to stay eternally young. You might, I, heard, I heard some lady on a commercial or something the other day somewhere. I don't know where it was. And she said, I don't intend to grow old cheerfully. I'm going to fight it all the way. In other words, she's saying, I'm going to try to keep myself in shape and fix myself up and comb my hair. I'm going to try my best to keep looking young as long as I can do it. Well, there ain't no use in that. You, you're getting older and you might as well just quit living in a dream world and put up with it and make the best out of it. You can do a lot of things that when you're older that you, that you can't when you're younger. So, you know, go on up the steps uh, and take advantage of where God's placed you. But I was meant to say this, we're running out of time. And what we, what we do, we better do quickly. Because, uh, as I've said, we are running out of time. Hebrews 12, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, for all you Christians that ain't doing what you're supposed to, look at this verse. For consider Him that endured such contradiction of sinners against Himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Now that's saying for all you Christians that are saying, I've had it. I'm sick and tired of this life. I'm just going to give up and throw in the towel. Fooey with it. Uh, Fooey is a Greek word that means to heck with. Uh, I, I ain't going I, I to live like this no more. I'm going to just do what I want to do. The Lord said, you better consider Jesus who went all the way up that hill. Boy, ain't you glad the Lord didn't get three-fourths of the way up there and say, I'm tired of carrying this cross. Fooey on them people up there in Pensacola. 
that's going to be born in a couple of thousand years. They ain't going to hell for all I care. I'm laying her down. Now, the Lord said, before you quit, you look at what He done, and then maybe you won't give up so easy. And sometimes you want to give up. And sometimes I want to get up, give up. I'll be honest with you tonight, and I know some of you are going to lose confidence in me when I say this, but there has been times in my Christian life, I really believe, now I don't know this for sure, but I believe if it hadn't been for all the responsibility I had and the people looking at me, I'd have probably hung it up. I'm ashamed to tell you that. And it's embarrassing, but it's the truth. And I thought, well, I can't hurt all these people and disappoint people and God. But then in a little while, God gave me something and I went on. Now, I ain't felt like that but a time or two in 14 years, but sooner or later, that time's coming to you. When I, I used to hear people get up and testify in church, and I was just bubbling over having the time of my life. And they'd say, boy, I'm discouraged and I'm about to quit. And I said, that's the stupidest person I ever heard of. Why would anybody want to quit? This is wonderful. This is glorious. But the day came when I knew exactly what they was talking about. And when everything caves in on you, and it feels like nothing's going right, and the devil slips up on your shoulder, and he says, why don't you just forget this? There's when you need to remember this Scripture. We are running the race for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not racing each other. We're racing time and the devil and sin before it gets our boys and our girls. Now, I want to say, you folks down here have got the Word of God. Oh, how thankful you ought to be for that and about that. But you need to take that thing and run with it, man. Get on the track and run for God. I want to say, first of all, the reason for our running. There's several reasons we ought to run the race. Number one, there's a great cloud of witnesses. If you just read Hebrews 11, I don't know how you other preachers believe about that. I just guess my, it's my opinion. Hebrews 11, he gives that great roll call of faith. He goes right into Hebrews 12, 1 and says, Wherefore, seeing that we are compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses. Now, the only people I can figure out who them great cloud of witnesses is, is them people he just got through talking about in chapter 11. And the Lord says it's like this. We're down in the theater running the race for God. We're down here on the track, and we got people down here that are watching us. See? All the people you work with are watching you. All the people that know you're a preacher are watching you. All the people that know you're a, you're a singer or whatever you are, they're watching you. Those are people in the stands around us. But then you'll notice in above those big theaters, up above the stands, they have what we call balconies. And you got people up there in the balconies come passing you around. Now, those people up in the heavenly balcony tonight are those that God let set around the, the top row of the balcony up there and is cheering me and you on in our race for the Lord. You see, we're running this race that got started a long time ago in, in the New Testament. We're running this race. And the race me and you in is a relay race. We ain't in a 220 or a 440 yard dash or a hundred yard dash. We are in a relay race. That's why Paul said, not I have finished the race. The race still ain't over with. He said, I finished my course. The race is still going on. Paul just had a course in it, and so do you and I. You see, the Lord started that thing there in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost. And them tons of fire come down. And boy, that thing got started and went out of there. And them boys got a hold of the torch. And you know how it is in a relay race? Son, you grab the torch and you haul off and take off running. And then when your course is over, you hand it to the next fella. And he grabs it. He's standing there waiting on you. And he grabs it and he takes off running. So, somebody gave that thing to the, the, the apostles there. And over there in the book of Acts, they gave it to Paul. And brother, he took off like 90 miles an hour and took off running. And right before Paul died, he come across in his course and handed it to Timothy. 
Timothy. And Timothy grabbed it and took off running. And he run and run and run and run and run. I don't know how long he lived, but he handed it to somebody else. And it came down through there through the early church Christians. And one kept handing it to another one and another one and another one. And somebody handed it to D.L. Moody and people like that. And they passed it on down to somebody else. And they passed it on down to somebody else. And they passed it on down to somebody else. And that old torch kept a burning. And somebody gave it to an old mountain preacher by the name of Joe Parson. And Joe Parson preached all over the mountains of North Carolina and Tennessee and Virginia for probably 40 years. And brother, he, right before he died in 1972, he died a few years after that, he brought that torch to my community, Nebo, North Carolina, and handed that thing over. And brother, I got saved and he handed it to me. And I said, well, here I go. And I took off a running and I'm a running my race tonight. And one of these days, I hope I'll finish my course and I'll reach over and hand it to him. And he'll say something and he'll grab it and he'll take off running and run his share of the race. But the race ain't over till the Lord comes and we cross the goal line. I'm glad to say tonight, brother, we have a great cloud of witnesses. And brother, I'm, I'm up. You sorry thing. You good for nothing. Low down. I, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. There's people up yonder in heaven that have died for this race. Their blood was shed for this race. They died so that me and you could run. Let's don't disappoint them and lay the torch down. Let's pick that thing up again and keep running. That race that God's give us a you say, I'm tired. Pick it up and run anyway. There's a mic demon up here. You say, I feel bad. Pick that thing up and go. You say, people's hurt my feelings. Run anyway. You say, preacher, they talked about me. What's well, better than getting sewed up in a bag of rattlesnakes, ain't it? Pick that thing up and go. You say, they don't like me around here. Well, run somewhere else with it. Give you no excuse to quit. Run, man, run. Run. These people depending on you. Boy, wouldn't it be awful if the Lord looked up there as Moody and Billy Sunday and, and, and Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards and, and John Wesley and all them. And he said, how would you like, fellas, for me to turn on the screen and let you see how the Christians are doing down there in Florida? And they look at us. And here we are, floundering around, brother, like some uh, flip flop in, out, up, down. Got the pooch mouth about three fourths of the time. Feeling sorry for herself. Sitting around feeling our minds with old junk where we're so weak that we can't. Oh, man. I, you know, you ladies, you'll sit there and watch them old soupy, soapy, soppy, sob stories. Till you ain't got no confidence in nobody. And everybody you know is having an affair. And you don't trust nobody. And you ain't got no confidence. You know what? You, you, you watch Dallas and Dynasty, don't you? That's the correct pronunciation. I said Dallas and Dynasty. But you gotta run, man. You gotta run. The second reason for running is with a goal in mind. Looking unto Jesus. Keep your eyes on the Lord. You've heard it said many times, but it'd be a good time to start practicing it. Keep your eyes on the Lord. If you get your eyes on me, I'll disappoint you. If I get my eyes on you, I'll disappoint, be disappointed in you. Brother, there is no man on this earth can live up to everything we expect him to live up to. If you get your eyes on your pastor, Brother Ruckman, and you say, well, well, they're not what they're supposed to be. Well, let, let me ask you something, dummy. Do you know anybody that is what they're supposed to be? Are you? Well, if you ain't, why do you think they ought to be? Well, they're a preacher. I believe everybody ought to be what they ought to be, but we ain't. So you keep your eyes on the Lord. Now, I'm telling you tonight, you know what that means? Tonight, I'm looking at that clock back there on the back of that wall. I don't know if that's a hint, or you just put that up when I'm coming, or what? 
And I have really tried to shut up quick this weekend. I, really, brother, I have. I know Brother Green feels cheated, but really, I've tried. But I watched that clock. Now, I can see old what's his name over here, but I ain't looking at him. And I can see, I believe there's, there's a man, there's a lady with a light colored dress on. There's a man, I don't believe he's got much hair. There's a man, here's a lady with something looked like a sweater on or something in a blue dress. And I ain't even looked at none of them. There's another that looked like it ain't got no hair. It's white one. Some people's turn gray, other people's turn loose. And there's another man, and there's another man, there's another man that looked like a little kid sitting right over there and all that. And I can see lights, and it looked like a string hanging down out of the ceiling there, a cobweb or something. And it's over here. Now, you know what I've done? I ain't looked at them things. I'm looking at that clock. Now, here's where I mess up. I'm running my race for the Lord. Man, I don't like that blue suit you got on there. Guess me, that's downright worldly, homosexual wear, something like that. No, I didn't mean that, brother, really. Now listen, now, why have I messed up, brother? What have I done wrong? I ain't supposed to be looking at what he's got on. I'm supposed to be looking at the clock. Well, you know, you go around this way and you look at the problems in your home or you look at the problems in your church or you look at the problems on your job and you go, and the Bible said, look unto Jesus. Keep your eyes on the Lord, brother. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Just keep on going. We're walking through vanity fire. I said we're going through vanity fire. You know what that is? There's temptations. There's, there's lights. There's all kinds of things. There's everything around the tempted. But just keep your eyes on the Lord. We're running with a goal in mind. It's a shame that we don't do any better than we do. And then the third reason for running is there's a crown awaiting. There's a reason for running, brother. God's got a crown waiting on us over there. Boy, I can just see when the saints go marching in, man. And the Lord getting out. Well, here's His doom. Here's he and crowning them as they come in. There's a crown awaiting. Let me say something briefly about the start of this race. There may be somebody here that ain't even in. I don't know. Well, you can get in tonight at the start of this race. The start of it, you've got to be admitted. Now let's say I heard you's got the dogs coming next week. The greyhounds, I've seen the signs around, you got dogs coming. And there might be human races around different places. But let's say down here in town somewhere next week, there's having a race for people. And next Saturday is a marathon. And you had to run 15 times around Pensacola City or something like that, you know, back and forth up and down Main Street or something. And they say, there's all them there, and they got it there, and the guy going, and they say, ladies and gentlemen, I, over here, and he begin uh, to the starting line, please. And everybody got up there, boy, and it's uh, the town that started that line. And about that time, I come walking up, and I said, I'm going to get in here and get in this race. And I get up there beside him. I said, all right, let's go, man. Blow the whistle. I'm ready. Let's get with it. And he, uh, somebody said, who are you? I said, doesn't matter. I'm here to run the race. They say, you ain't in this race. Why? You're not even been admitted. You don't have a number on your back. You, uh, what's your number? I don't have a number. Well, how can you win without a number? You can't run the race. Get out of here. Well, I can outrun any of these people. Put me on here. They say, I'm sorry. You've got to be admitted. Amen. And I said, okay. What have I got to do to be admitted? They said, the first thing you've got to do is go down and register. And you register and put your name down and some information about you. And then you go in the little room and weigh in. And you got to be in a certain weight class before you can run in this race, you know. They might have the people from uh, 100 to 300 in one class. And they might have somebody blow 100 in another class, over 400 in a class, another class. And they might have all kinds of things like that. All right, I got to go down there. I got to get on the scales. If I weigh too much, I can't get in. If I don't weigh enough, I can't get in. I've got to be admitted. Now, the same way, you can't run for the Lord Jesus Christ until you are officially admitted into the race. 
First thing you got to do is you got to go down and get registered. I don't mean join the church. I don't. I mean come down and get in, brother. You may have been to a church member all of your life. There may be somebody here that has went to church all of your born days, but you've never been admitted. You've never. I didn't say committed. That's what they're going to do to us later. I said admitted. You've never been admitted in the race. You've never been born again. You've never been saved. That's the first thing you do. There's no use in you trying to clean your life up and get in the running and run the race until you're officially in. You can belong to church. Every church in Escabia County and die and go to hell. You can be baptized so many times a tadpole know your social security number and bust hell wide open when you die. You gotta be in, brother. You gotta be in. Now let me ask you something. Has the Lord ever put you in? Has there ever been a time in your life when God put you in? You know how you get in? You have to go down and be weighed. And you gotta get on the scales. You say, I know, preacher. You're saying, if my good outweighs my bad, I'll get in. Right? Wrong. You're on the scales with the Lord Jesus. You gotta balance out with Him. That's why Paul said that I may be found in Him. You get weighed in. You see, this is the admitting of the race. Now, there's a weigh-in room, and if you're overweight and got your sins hanging on you, you can't run. You might as well go back and get admitted first. But you see, it's like this. April the 19th, 1972, I, as an 18-year-old boy, went down the aisle at Nebo Baptist Church. There were so many people at the altar, it's like last night. There were so many people at the altar, you couldn't get near it. I fell down about ten feet back there, face first, prostrate on the floor. That night I settled the old account with the Lord. And the Lord said up there in heaven. And He said, you get that? And the angel went, yes sir, got him right here. And about that time the angel up in heaven said, Ladies and gentlemen, and, and all them fellers up there, the El Moody and all them guys got up. And he said, we just got a new contestant here in the race, down there for the Lord Jesus. Introducing in lane number 1,444,312, Danny Castle! And they all went, woo! Glory! Run, son, run! Run, man, run! Run! And boy, the Lord took me, a little 18-year-old boy, and put me out there and said, which way? I go, which way do I go, Lord? They said, tithe. I said, I'll tithe. They said, join the church. I said, I'll join the church. They said, put, be baptized. I said, I'll be baptized. I said, just point me out in the direction and tell me which way to go. And boy, I got up, took off like a road runner. And man, they put me on that track. And it didn't make the papers the night I got saved. And my hometown didn't say nothing about the great revival in which over a hundred young people made professions of faith. But I like the old song that said, it made me news in heaven when I got saved. Amen? Well, they went down Glory Boulevard and said, extra, extra, read all about it, the Lord saved souls in North Carolina. I got in. I don't know about you. That's the way you get in the race. But then all of a sudden I had to go through training. And the Lord said, since this is a distance race, Brother Danny, you're going to have to train. You might just take off like a shot out of a cannon and run a hundred yard dash. You people that smoke might even do that. But he said, this is going to be more than a hundred yards. As a matter of fact, he didn't tell me near how long it was going to be. I thought the Lord was coming about the first year or two after I got saved. He didn't tell me I was going to have to run 15 years. The Lord didn't tell Brother Ruckman 40 years ago nearly. Preacher, you're going to run 40 years. But He'll sure put you in training. Now, how does a man train? You get plenty of rest, exercise, all that kind of stuff. And it depends on the discipline of your body and you're training what kind of a runner you'll be. A strong, healthy heart. You know what David said over in Psalms? 
I will run the way of your commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. David said, Lord, I'm ready to run. Enlarge my heart. Here I go. And you got to start training. Now you know your way to train. Now I ain't never been one of these joggers. And you might be, and more power to you if you are, man, but that's about the boringest thing I ever tried to do in my life. But you might get out there and you say, I'm going to go a mile today. I'm going to go two miles tomorrow. I'm going to go three miles the next day. I'm going to go... And you're getting in shape. You're getting in shape for the big one. And you just keep a running and a running. Now what you do is you are in training. Now, the first unit, it's not a 220. It requires temperament. It requires oxygen. It requires stamina. It requires endurance. It requires strength. You don't just come down here and pop off like a firecracker and say, here I go. I'm going to do this and do that. You'll burn out like a firecracker. You better get down and plan for the long haul. Thirdly, the rules of the race. Every race has rules. They say we got three rules in this race. Number one, lay aside every weight. Now all runners have this in common. No unnecessary weights. They get, you look at them runners. Their shoes don't weigh three ounces. Son, they ain't got on enough clothes to make a jaybird of pile running shorts. As they said, a mosquito can fly through them little shorts they wear and not even break a wing. Now, the reason for that is, is because they don't want nothing hindering them. The old folks used to sing, I don't want nothing down here to hinder me. I heard a man sing that way up in Kentucky about a year or two ago, and you don't ever hear that song. I don't want nothing down here to hinder me. Buddy, them old boys, get down there. What would you think about me? If you saw, well, the Pensacola Marathon is on TV. Well, there's Brother Danny. He's going to go down there and enter it. And there's all them little guys on there got their little shorts on. And, buddy, they got their, they got their uh, Reeboks or, and Adidas and tracks and, and everything else. Boy, and they got the lightweight running kind and them little bitty socks. That they roll down there, and they just got on a little, little bit of a shirt. They ain't got no arms in it, or I'm just enough to soak up a sweat, you know. And boy, they're run, getting ready to run, and here I come. And I woke up, and I've got on army boots with steel toes in them, and there's a big old thick pair of pants, and then another pair of pants over that, and a hunting jacket. And I've got over here, and I've got my a big old thing over here, and got tools in it, and hammers, and screwdrivers, and everything, you know. And then I've got my jam box on my shoulder, and I come down there, you know. And I've got my guitar over this shoulder, and and I'm trying to carry a bag of bag of apples over here, and I've got a Pepsi under this arm. And I, well, here I am. Let's go running. Why oh, you fool you? You ain't gonna win no race like that. Say what I gotta do? I gotta get rid of some of that junk. That's how some of you's trying to run for God. You know what that music was I was talking about last night? That's a 20 pound hammer in your back pocket. Everything. There's a lot of things you can't pinpoint as being a sin, but it's a weight. And you can't run with that junk hanging on you. And lay aside the weight. Secondly, well, let me say this before I say that. You've got to stay in your assigned lane. My lane is 1,400,000, whatever what I said it was a while ago. And that's my lane. That ain't his lane. That ain't his lane. It's my lane. Their lane ain't my lane. My lane ain't their lane. It's none of him my business how he runs his lane. You heard me, didn't you? And it's none of his business how I run my lane. My job is to run my lane. I can't win a race looking around trying to straighten out how everybody's running their lane. And neither can you. You have got a 24-hour-a-day job keeping up track with the devil in your lane, friend. 
and you do not have time to go sneaking around everywhere trying to straighten out everybody else's problems. Amen? Amen. Amen. I can't hear you. Hey, God put you in the race to run. God didn't call you to straighten out how everybody else is running. Here I go. And it's my lane. You say, well, what about Brother Tim? I ain't got time to fool with him. I've got a race to run. You say, well, i seen Sam Reed smoking a cigar. Fool it. I don't care. I've got a, line. I've got a race to run. You say, well, I, oh, Brother McGahey over there. You know, I saw him doing it. Well, big deal, man. I've got a race to run. You say, I've seen this and knew that. And this and knew that. It don't matter. God's given me a lane to run in. Hey, I'll stay up here tonight and, and pray with you. I'll stay out in my motel room tonight and go over the Scriptures and I'll pray, but I ain't got five minutes to argue with you. i got a race to run. Have you ever been somewhere and somebody try to get you up and argue with you? I think, well, you idiot, you ain't you got better things to do than go around fussing and arguing? Why don't you get in your lane and run? I reckon it's probably an excuse you're too lazy to run, so you want to appear spiritual, and then you're looking around inspecting everybody else's tennis shoes and see if they're tied right, and you like the color of their socks, or if you don't believe in the way they do that. Oh, shut up, man! Get back in your lane and run for God! You say, well, what about this person doing wrong? The Lord will get him. No problem. There's a judge sitting up there that's got a real good view. And he's writing down, and if a man steps that far out of his lane, God will disqualify him when the time's right. Yes, sir, he will. Boy, you know, I, I, this wasn't really in the message, but I'll throw this in right here. Did you know something? We have to run through dark times and good times. I heard a preacher say something one time a few months ago that rung a bell in my soul, and I will pass it on to you. And he's talking about the Bible, the Word of God. And he brought that verse in there about the Word of God being a light. And you know, sometimes it gets dark while we're running. Matter of fact, me and you's in the night time in the Bible, Amen. which means we better have some light. Amen. We ain't going to bust our brains out on a tree somewhere. Yeah. And son, it's pitch dark out there, and you've got to look this way, and we got that light, see? Now, if I'm going down the road, I'm driving like this, and if I'm going at a moderate speed on a clear night, I got my lights on what we call low beam. But if I say, boy, it might be trouble up ahead, you know what I can do? I can hit that little button down there. You heard, you heard up north. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it anyway. Up north, way up there where Brother Grace lives and places like that. Amen. That, he's gone now. Uh, you know all these cars where they got the dimmer switch on the... Up here on the column side, yep. steering wheel. They're recalling every one of them. Amen. Back to the factory days. There's too many Pollocks up there getting killed. They can't get their foot up that high. <laughs> I just threw that in there to get the demons out of some of you. But anyway, as I was saying, you got this switch here in the floor or on the column. And when you want to see way down yonder somewhere, you hit that switch and then the high beam comes on. And there's a verse of Scripture in the Bible in Psalm 119 that says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so in this Bible that I hold here tonight, that thing's got the low beam. If you want to see what's right in front of you at any given time, it's a lamp under my feet. So I can walk, make sure every time I step my foot down that I'm right on target. It's a little lamp. But when I want to see way out there in front of me and wonder what's in the future, I can just look in there and flip the switch and that turns it on a high beam. It's a light under my path. And buddy, he'll show you way out yonder. That's why we know the rapture's coming, and the Antichrist is coming, and the tribulation, and the millennium, and the great white throne in eternity, because it's a lamp under my feet, it's a light under my path. And you take that thing with you and run. You stay in your lane. 
God didn't let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And most preachers nowadays believe the Lord's words fell to the ground. If God kept Samuel's words from falling, He can sure keep His own. And then, quickly, you've got to run with patience. Now, there's one thing that distinguishes the distance runner from the dash runners. Patience. Run with patience. Take it easy, boys. If the Lord don't come next week, run with patience. I hope He comes next week. I hope He comes this year. But what if He don't? What are you going to do? What if He don't come in 89? What if He don't come in 90? What if He don't come in 91? That's why the Bible said run with patience. Oh, surely He will. Well, He might and He might not. Maybe He will. Maybe He won't. I'd hold up Brother Train to run to 2,000 and just have to run to 88 as to train to run to 88 and have to run to 2,000. Might be a little unnecessary training, but they know you're taking no chances. Amen? Here we go. A fast distance runner does this. Well, you might not see me down there. Let me get up here. He gets on the balls of his feet. If I was going to run a 100-yard dash... I'd do just like this or like this. And, buddy, I'd watch that guy that's going to blow that whistle. And as he blowed that whistle, I'd go, I should have worn my tennis shoes tonight. And, you know, the heels of my feet would never touch the ground. I'd be right on my toes, just like that. But if I'm going to run a long way, you say, well, we're going out here and we're going to run five miles, preacher. Then I'm going to do different. I'm going to put them heels down on the ground. Like that. And I'm going, you know why? Oh, we may be doing this a while. In, in high school, when I played basketball, after I got up about the 11th grade, son, I know what's going to happen on the first day of ball practice. Some of them boys, you know what they thought? A bunch of freshmen would always go out for the team. And them boys really thought, boy, we get out there, we're going to all choose up and scrimmage for about two hours. It'll be fun. We're going out for basketball. What they didn't know was, the first week of practice, you don't touch a ball. Yeah, that's right. You don't do nothing but run. You run your fool head off. And our coach says, all right, fellas, line up. Here's about... 25 freshmen and about 15 sophomore juniors and seniors. At that time, you know, just had one little high school. Everything from ninth grade up was all one team except the JVs. And he'd say, line up, we're going to run laps. And all them freshmen, you ought to have seen them. They'd get like this, blow it, blow it. I'm going to show you. I can, I can show these seniors and these juniors up. Blow that whistle, buddy. Watch this, watch this, coach. Blow it. Here's the way we'd stamp. The time I got 12th grade, I stood there like this. Because I knowed what was coming. And he'd go, and buddy, as soon as he'd do that, they'd take a, went running around like that like crazy. They'd be going, our gym was real little in our little high school. Our crowds would be so good, so big, that we'd played on a round floor many a time. You ever play basketball on a round court? There'd be so many people, they'd be standing around the corners. Court didn't have no corners like that. Buddy, it was a fiasco, man. You'd knock a referee down, jump into the crowd, popcorn drinks, little kids screaming. Boy, it was a blessing sign back in them days. Well, I shouldn't use that terminology. It was, we had a ball. I didn't know what a blessing was then. And them boys would take off running like crazy. And we'd take off about like this. Watch this, coach! They'd be making about four rounds to our one. And you know what coach done? He went in his office and sat down and drunk coffee, a sadistic, wicked, ungodly thing. 
and just left us out there doing this. Are you keeping up with me, brother? And you know something? We just done that and done that and done that. And it wasn't about five or ten minutes till we started seeing them big tough boys laying out in the bleachers puking. About five minutes. One of those <laughs> passing out, running to the bathroom. Here we still get it like this. And I've seen them do that in the Lord's work, ain't you? Boy, I've seen them come in. Well, bless God, I'll do this and I'll do that. I'll straighten out the world. I know the backward, the Bible. Backwards and forwards. Don't laugh at me. You get up here and try it sometime. My mind's about three sentences ahead of my mouth. It's hard to get it all right. Let me tell you something. You see them laying down on the side of the road somewhere. I kind of, I'm kind of i a leery of these people that get saved, and the very next day they know everything. And I like to see them guys kind of simmer for a little while and get in the book and get rooted and grounded and get ready for the long haul. Let me say quickly. The finish of the race. And I'll say this and I'm through. It's the crossing. It's not the one that runs the fastest or the prettiest, but who crosses the goal line. You say, well, I can't run as good as brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Yeah, but if you just stay in your lane and cross the goal line. I believe there's been a lot of people quit church because they felt like that they couldn't live up to everybody else's standards that they had set for them and just gave up. Now you listen to me, discouraged soul, if you're here tonight. Just because you ain't everything everybody thinks you ought to be, don't let that just make you disappoint the Lord. Run. If you can't go but two miles an hour, run. You say, well, Brother Danny, I've had so many things happen to me and now I'm all crippled up. Cross the goal line on crutches. Crawl in if you have to. Just cross the thing, man. God ain't measuring us by our speed. He just wants you to finish. Get up. Get up and go. Get up and go. At the start of this meeting, some of you have been laying in a ditch puking spiritually. You may be there tonight saying, there's no use of me trying. Please get up and run again. Amen. Well, I've tried it so many times. Try it one more. Please. Try it one more time. That might, that might be over the next hill. We'll be home. You don't never know, man. The Lord might be coming in the next few days. Listen, brother. Re-enlist. Get up and say, God, count me in. God, I'm going to run. Cross the goal line. I heard about a captain that was shot in a battle. And he's trying to get to the top of a hill and he got shot. And he wasn't dead, but he's in the hospital. And somebody went to see him. And they said, Captain, where'd they shoot you? And he said, Almost at the top. You understand that? What, that guy meant where'd they shoot you in the leg, in the arm. He wasn't even thinking about where he got shot. He said, I was almost at the top. He's still thinking about the top, brother. He's still thinking about the goal line. There's a crowning. There are no crown wearers in heaven. They were not cross wearers on earth. A man's not crowned unless he strive lawfully. Hold fast that which thou hast. That no man take your crown. Some of you people sitting here tonight, somebody at work's trying to take your crown. Some old flirtatious hussy is trying to get some of you guys deceived and mess up your home and take your crown God's going to give you. Don't let her trick you with her eyelids. 
Some of you ladies sitting here, some old cutie pie lover boy that ain't fit to have his head blowed off and probably got AIDS, but you don't know it yet. And you won't till it's too late. He's already trying to mess you up and take your crown off of your head. Well, Brother Daddy, my race is too hard to run. Get up and take another step or two. You can do it. You can do it. Come on. We got confidence in you, man. Get up and get back in there. For God. Years ago, and I close with this illustration. In the days of Nero, there was a band of soldiers. You've read this story probably. The emperor's wrestlers. And they would always march for Nero. And they'd say, We the wrestlers marching for thee, O, o king to win for thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. And they would march all the time. We the wrestlers wrestling for thee, O king, to win for thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. And word got back to the emperor that some of those men had accepted the Lord Jesus as their Savior. And he called them out and he went down there and he said, How many of you have professed to know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Step forward. And forty of those wrestlers stepped forward. He said, I'll give you a chance to back out and recant. They wouldn't recant. He said, take them down out of the lake. Strip off their clothes there so they wouldn't have anything on their, on their feet. And send them out walking on the ice out into the cold night till they finally drop in out yonder somewhere. And those 40 wrestlers got down there on that ice barefooted. And they said, go until you deny your Savior. And buddy, they walked out. Out through there. And the leader of that group was called uh, Vespasian. He was like a centurion that was in charge of them. And he took them down there and he said, March, fellas, till you drop off in the ice and freeze to death. And those guys went marching out through there and they were saying, We the wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, to win for thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. We the wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, to win for thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. And way out into the night, they could see them going out through yonder. And somebody hollered, anybody want to recant? And they were going out through there saying, Forty wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, to win for thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. And about that time, one of them turned around and said, I recant. I'm giving up. It's too rough. I can't stand the thoughts of it. And gave up. Them old boys never even looked back and said, Thirty-nine wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, to win for thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. That's the way we need to do, folks. Brother, if somebody drops out, keep on going anyway. If fifteen quit, make it fifteen less and go on for God. Thirty-nine wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, to win for thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. And old Vespasian the centurion got under such conviction that he hollered out and he said, Wait a minute! And he took off his boots and his socks and, and everything and went running out through there and caught up with them. And brother, they kept marching out into the night. Forty wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, to win for thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. You'll see a lot come and go while we're down here. Just make sure you keep your eyes on the Lord. And cross that goal line. And if there's somebody here tonight that's quit running... And see, the devil knows what it takes to get you too, And he just kept hitting you and hitting you and hitting you and hitting you and hitting you until finally you just quit. Let me encourage you tonight. Run back and catch up with the group. It'll be worth it. Let's bow our heads. Now, I'm going to give a brief invitation. Brother Green's going to come and preach. I want to come to the instruments right quickly. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Some are already coming tonight. You say, oh boy, somebody's already coming. That means he wasn't talking to me. No, the Lord, you know who the Lord's speaking to tonight. It's worth it. Do you hear me? It's worth it. Don't blow it. Somebody's looking at you. Somebody's watching you. If you blow it, you'll cause some other young person to blow it. 
You'll suffer. Do you hear me? You'll suffer. It may look like the easy way out now, but you'll pay one day. Instruments play softly tonight. If God's speaking to your heart, I want you to get up out of your seat right there where you see it. Come down here and say, God, put me in. That's right, come on. Put me in the race, Lord. Put me in the race. You say, Brother Danny, I run for a long time. And to be honest with you, I just got tired of it. Well, you might have quit right before we got to heaven. Please come. Please come! This may be the most important night of the rest of your life. What you decide to do here tonight. You know good and well what God wants you to do. You know the Lord wants you in there running in your lane. Nobody can run your lane but you. If you don't run it, that lane's just going to be vacant. Nobody can do it but you. Please, don't let the devil talk you out of it. Things is bad enough already without you deserting us. We need you and you need us. Us Christians, we need each other. How about it, young preacher? How about it? We need you, preacher boys! And your dear wives and families, your boys and girls, please don't blow it. Please don't blow it. We love you. God loves you. There's been times when all of us quit running. But oh, thank God for a second chance. You can get back in there and try it again. We're going to wait just a few seconds. Brother's coming to lead the song or close or whatever how he feels led to do. It'll be worth it all. Maybe we'll sing that. It'd be good if we could. Every time you got your nose bloodied, every time you put up with stuff you don't want to put up with, but you do it for the Lord, it'll be worth it one day. It'll be worth it. Please. Maybe, there, may, Folks, I don't never do this, but this on my heart is heavy. If God has put something on your heart as a Christian to do, and I ain't saying what that might be, I want you to get out of your seat and do it right now. Maybe you just need to come here to your pastor or Dr. Ruckman or somebody and just hug their neck and say, Brother, I appreciate you and I'm with you and I'm running with you. Maybe you need to just say, folks, I need you to help me pray this thing through. Come on! Let's do it tonight! Let's do it. We ain't got much time. Whatever the Lord's telling you to do right now, young people, teenagers, maybe you sit here last night and toughed it out and didn't come to the altar. It'll be worth it one day if you get it right. Please don't blow it. Please don't blow it. If I could say anything that would influence you to get in there and run for God, I'd, if I could stand on my head on this pulpit, if I could jump off top of this building, I'd do it. If that'd help you. But it won't! You've got to do it yourself! Why don't you come right now? Whatever God's telling you to do, why don't you do it right now? God wanting to do a, send a great revival right here tonight. The Lord's wanting to do a great thing here tonight, if you'll let Him. Come on. Come on right now. Will you? Will you? Will you come? Let's get in this race, brother! Let's get in this race, sister! Let's get in the race. Thank God, some's, some's are moving. Thank God for you ladies over here moving, doing what God's telling you to do. Bless your heart. You say, oh, that's silly. Hey, man! We need you and you need us. We need you and you need us. Don't desert the ship. Don't desert the ship. I've seen some people deserted. You go back and look at them ten years later. Their life is ruined. They're wretches. They're drinking themselves, trying to be happy. Trying to get money. Trying to get clothes. Trying to get a car. 
It won't work. It won't work. It won't work. The devil will tell you it will work, but it won't work. God has put you in the race. Please don't blow it. Now we're going to tarry here just a moment. I wasn't even planning on giving an invitation tonight. Please don't feel bad at me. We're going to wait just a few seconds and we're going to pray. The Lord loves you. Don't blow it. Don't blow it. Get in the race, man. Get in the race. Let bygones be bygones. Start out all over again. Hey, the devil's after you people down here in Pensacola. I, I can't think of a place in America the devil would rather mess up a church than right here. The devil wants to mess you people up. Can't you see it's the devil? It ain't a, what you think it is. It's the devil. A low down, sorry devil. Don't let him throw you a loop. He'll tell you you're not appreciated. He'll tell you you're not wanted. He'll, he'll tell you every fool thing in the world if you believe him. Get in that lane and run for God. It ain't going to be long. Please. These folks around up here praying, I don't know what to do except just wait a minute. If you're not in no hurry tonight, it's Sunday. I've been praying before I come down here. I've been fasting. I just want you to know that. There's people praying. Thank God, here's another man. Hallelujah.